welcome back, everybody. It's Screen Preach Episode 7. And, uh, we're gonna talk about movies today in the name of the Godfather, Son of Odin, and the Holy Jedi. And I suppose today's the day where you say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because it's Easter. And I had no fucking idea it was Easter, because the days are kind of just rolling into each other, one after the next. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. Uh, it's just... Uh, <clears throat> Let's see what happens with this. Let's see if it can just keep recording like a normal computer would do if I had one of them. God, I wonder what they look like. I wonder what they work like. If I had a like a new Mac, for all you people out there with like new Macs, they must work so great. It must be like when you get a new phone and it's like it's it works fast and it's like just fucking just everything responsive like still can't snap like that whatever I don't know look if you're uh if you're quarantining and shit with family don't take for granted the company that you have around you I can't even imagine what it's like for single people without a pet. <laughs> it's a little better because of that. Um, and obviously, you know, in this day and age, you can FaceTime your family and everything, but... It's still... It's still different than having them right here. Just don't take for granted the fact that you have your family with you during all this... Um, what else is going on? What else is going on this week? I got a new, so I got my buddy to do a, a new theme music for this, a new score. So soon you'll hear a new theme when we open on these episodes, which is cool. I can't wait to do that. Uh, he's, he's looping the track for me currently, so we'll have that soon. Um... What else? All the national days this week. National Puppy Day, National Sibling Day, National Pet Day, National Fuck Day, National... <laughs> Do we need Puppy Day and Pet Day? Why not just do Pet Day and then it all falls in the same category? I don't know. Who comes up with these fucking days anyway? Who, who's the guy or girl? Gal, um, doing that. And is this like a, it's like a government thing? People, who, who comes up with these days? I don't even, whatever. Uh, LA is, it's doing all right. LA's all right. It's, it's not, I can't get a stretch of sunny days. Um, well, I guess I just did. It was, it was nice. No, no, it wasn't. It was a rainy week. Yesterday was beautiful. Went all the way down to the beach, 50-minute drive. Guess what they're doing now? They're closing the beaches. So now it's really getting... They're making it even harder for us out here. I mean, you're not supposed to go out. So what was... I, I should have known that was going to happen at some point, but... It was just a nice thing to have once once or twice a week. Just go there and get away from it all. You know, when you're on the beach right now, it's kind of like nothing's going on. Like nothing bad is happening. You can just escape. And and they took that away now too. I get it. I get it. I'm just, it just sucks. Uh, and it sucks for her too. She needs to run around. And that was her favorite thing every week, and now we can't do that. There's not a whole lot left. To, there's just anything I can do inside is what I'm doing. 
Um, and now all we can do now is take a bunch of walks. So we're just going to have to take more walks. You know, we'll, we'll take more walks. Um, that's, uh, that's where we're at here. So yeah, episode 7. This week I'm going to talk about something older. Um, the, the big main quote that that I take away from it is, is that line. So I'm going to talk about White Boy Rick today. Um, that line where he's like, We get caught, we do black time. You get caught, you do white time. And that that line stands out the most because it it's not true. It ends up not being true. Um, the point of this story was to let people know that that Rick Wersh Jr. got fucked over because he did. And and obviously what he did was illegal, but it's it's it goes well beyond legal and illegal, as I'll get into. Um, I haven't. So I I wanted to see this movie for a while. I knew about it back when it was out in 2018. And I wanted to I wanted so I, I figured why not talk about it um cuz I finally got to watch it. Uh and I and I wanted to talk about it because well first of all I'm running out of new stuff. <laughs> I'm still mourning the fact that we're going to have a summer without Marvel. I don't know what, you know, um still processing that little bit now but also I wanted to talk about this because it's a good example well it first of all it relates to something that I have been writing since fucking high school I've been working on a TV show idea about a young kid who's in like a mafia family and he has to take over responsibilities he has to sacrifice his freedom for his family he has to it's a it's something I've just been constantly going back to for years, trying to pull from my my own culture, my own experiences, and just put everything I have into this project. And it's and there's a sample of it on my website, a Ben Morganti story. dot com. Um, but it's a, this movie was a good example, I guess, of what not to do. Or how to approach having a a kid protagonist in a world of crime, and it's not easy. It's not easy to write that story, as I'll get as, as I'll get into with this, because there were there were a lot of flaws in this movie. Um, but it's a tough subject to to make your protagonist like young, you know, not fully. I guess developed, not having hasn't lived a, enough of a life, have hasn't had enough experiences to really even relate to older audiences. I guess I don't know. Um, it's tough. It's tough to have a younger protagonist. With that being said, it's it's tough to have a younger protagonist in this genre. It just it it brings up a lot of challenges you wouldn't think of. Um, but I don't know. I guess that's there was a there was a related relatability here with this movie and what I was writing. So I figured I'll fucking talk about it. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, don't fucking stop. It's like literally when I move the mouse, it starts fucking skipping, and at any moment, it could stop. And then I gotta do this whole thing. I gotta cut. I gotta get up, cut that, then start up again. The whole fucking. And then it's more cutting and editing, too. Lining up the audio with the video is not easy if you have cuts. For fuck's sake. (laughs) Just (laughs) keep keep going. We're not. We've done this a million times now. Not really. Seven times, six times. But just fucking work with me. It's fine. Keep, keep going. There you go. I want to get into the news of the week. Can I get into it? Without you stopping on me? It's it's very frustrating, by the way. I mean, you're not seeing what I'm... 
I cut the ca I cut out shit. But if this thing ever does stop, I fucking lose my shit because it's annoying. Record. I, I mean, I can't even... I don't know how to feel right now. Did you see the cut? Yeah, that's because it, it did exactly what I, I, I knew it was going to do. I don't even know how to comfortably record right now because I, I, I just feel it's just going to do it again. It's just going to do it again. There might be a lot of cuts in this episode, people. And unfortunately... Unfortunately, because I, I do actually enjoy this when it works. You know, this should be the highlight of my week. It's supposed to be fun. But it ends up being the most stressful time of my whole week. Because the technology I have works against me every step of the way. It's frustrating. It's unbelievably frustrating. I, I'm just... Uh, I might have to put the whole show on... On hold. I'm gonna have to delay like everything else is because of this fucking coronavirus. And it's because I don't have the funds to replace the equipment. <laughs> and I'm not working. <sighs> Can we get through 10 episodes before I have to put the show on hold? This is episode 7. Let's see if we can do this. I'm gonna try to talk about news. I'm gonna open up the window for the internet now, okay? <sighs> Fucking kill me. <sighs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it gonna stop again? Uh, skipping like a motherfucker. Wait for it. <sighs> the more time I waste, though, the more. Fucking... Nope. I can't even move my mouse. This is insane. I'm sorry, guys. I really wanted to talk about White Boy Rick and the news. I just feel like it's going to fight me the whole way today. It's just one of those weeks. It's really not going to work. I even restarted the computer and everything. That usually works. It's not. It's not doing what I fucking... <clears throat> Let's get into news and see if it... So... MGM... MGM is, has bought uh, Ridley Scott and Lady Gaga's true crime drama about the Gucci family. So a new movie coming out. Uh, bi biographical about the Gucci family. And Ridley Scott is directing it. Ridley Scott is the director of great films like Alien, Gladiator, The Martian. I could go on for days. That guy's a legend. Um, he is directing it, and Lady Gaga will, it looks like, be starring in it. I would scroll down and see if there's details about who she's playing, but I, I swear if I even touch this right now, it's going to stop recording. You know what this looks like? If I... And just X out of some of these tabs. Maybe that'll help. Stay with me. Stay with me. Why did that fucking... Ugh, oh, what a shitty episode. You guys gotta just watch me deal with technical fucking issues. I'm gonna keep going. Let me see if I can remember. I, I have it all listed. See if I can remember some of the other news. Um, and I, I was there wasn't a whole lot of news this week, so I was gonna just talk about some stuff that I, I that I've been following and I thought was interesting from the past few months. Maybe some stuff that they that got revealed before even the podcast started. Uh, there's some stuff that I I wanted to talk about. Um, okay, that actually might have helped getting rid of. There's just a lot of stuff open. Um, <clears throat> so they're also doing a, so Disney Plus is continuing to bring back stuff. They're doing like re, reboots and, and re, revamps on shit. They're doing 
uh, new Doogie Hauser spinoff. Doogie Hauser is an old classic with um, Neil Patrick Harris played the young doctor. They're redoing that. It'll be on Disney Plus, and it looks like the female lead will be the main character of this one. So there's some some new new stuff. That's cool for anyone who was a big fan of that show. Um, I I still I I, don't, I haven't seen that show, so um, I don't know who the female lead of that show was, but I think whoever she was, she's the main character of this new one. Um, what else? Yeah, so the whole Marvel thing's the big thing still. No Marvel until the fall or late summer. It, it, it's still very possible. The shows are still on track at this point. We have the Falcon and Winter Soldier in August. I'm hoping that those dates don't change because I'm really looking forward to that show. Falcon and Winter Soldier. That's going to be so fucking cool. I mean, that's... That's where... Your new Captain America. Sam fucking Wilson. And he gets his own... Him and... Him and... Uh, it, I can't... Even begin... That's that's a hype... I'm hyped for that one. And I, so I hope that that release date's still on. It, this is... Honestly, it's a blessing in disguise, probably. It's probably a good thing in the long run for Marvel. That there's this delay. It gives them... It gives the artists more time to just keep working on things and make things better. Um, it, uh, uh, Doctor Strange director, Scott Dirk, Dirkers, Dickerson, Dirkerson, whatever, um, he mentioned that. He said how it's a, it's a good thing for Marvel that this is going on. Uh, he, I think he used... Um, he used... Uh, Shit. He used a movie from back in the day as an example. Oh yeah, well there was something in the eighties where the, when the writers' strikes were going on or something. I don't know. There was delays back in the eighties for something, and it gave James Cameron or someone more time to work on what they were working on. What the fuck was it? Shit. No, why is this escaping me? And I, I would pull it up, but I can't pull it up without thinking this is going to stop recording. Ah, fuck. Uh, <clears throat> just all falling apart. And I need a haircut so bad. And if I was at home, my mother cuts hair for a living. <laughs> so that's ironic. The timing couldn't have been more impeccable for me to move out here. Um, oh man, I really wanted to talk about this. Matt Reeves, the director of the Batman, he, he, he was interviewed, so he talked a little bit about the new Batman and how it's not an origin story, but it explores his origins. So he's taking a different approach to the origin of Batman. Um, in this one, which is definitely good. We've seen it. We know that. We know how he becomes Batman. We know all that. Uh, so you have to take a different approach to it. But he gets into it. He talks about it. I'm going to try to scroll down and read this. Um, uh, Matt Reeves says, I wanted, to, I wanted to do not an origin tale, but a tale that would still acknowledge his origins in that it formed who he is. Like this guy, he's majorly struggling, Bruce Wayne, is majorly struggling, and this is how he's trying to rise above that struggle. But that doesn't mean that he even fully understands. It's that whole idea of the shadow self and what's driving you and how much of that you, you can incorporate and how much of it you're doing that you're unaware of. Okay. I was 
just kind of um, uh, yeah he said he wasn't entirely sure Warner Brothers would accept his pitch for a bat for a Batman movie because it prioritized the human humanism of the character over the action spectacle but that's wait that's cool if if we take a psych psychological approach to Batman I think that is something fresh like really dive into him psychologically Reeves said I'm going to pitch the version of Batman that I would do which is going to have a humanist bent and who knows if they'll have any interest if they don't then I won't do it and that'll be okay I was really lucky that they said yes. Um, there's something in there that feels very psychological, very emotional. I'm I'm just looking forward to seeing Batman on the big screen again. Honestly, it's been a, a enough time has passed, and I, I just want to see it again. And I have hopes for Matt Reeves. I love the Planet of the Apes trilogy that he was integral to making. Great. Um, I don't know. I'm all over the place today, but it's not. It's just because I can't help but feel like it's going to stop recording. It does this. Uh, yeah, see, I was going to talk about the Sandman. This is old news, but it's still good to. So the Sandman is is the is a DC Vertigo character. So that it was their darker. They'd had like a run of darker characters. Um, I'm reading the the Sandman comics now. So and I've I'm only I've only read one volume, and it's already fucking incredible. So the fact that they're doing a sh so Netflix, this has a, there's a long history with the Sandman sh series. Neil Gaiman, the writer of the comics, is also writing the series, and he's been trying to get it made for years. At one point, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was attached to direct and star in it. At one point, I think Seth Rogen was. I don't. It was there's a long history of it, and Netflix finally picked it up. And now I think it's so it's finally moving forward with Netflix. It's one of those shows that has a lot of potential to be like like a big, um, like Stranger Things level good, um, I guess for Netflix and shit. I, I'm I can't wait to see to see, to see it. I, um, Vertigo DC's Vertigo lines include other characters like the pre like Preacher. If you saw if you watched Preacher. Um, on AMC, like that was fun and, and different. That's that's a Vertigo, that's a DC Vertigo character. So to get a feel of what kind of tone, it's just different. It's more um, more supernatural, um, and 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 somehow darker too. Darker, you know, darker than some of their regular DC characters. Darker than Batman. Darker, just. Uh, even more gritty than we're used to seeing. And then I wanted to talk about how uh, the creators of Game of Thrones, they're getting ready to do their next, uh, they're working on their next project, and it's a, it's a movie. Um, holy shit. And that's, and it's Vertigo as well. Vertigo DC Comics graphic novel Lovecraft. Yeah, now there's look at that. Uh, that's what they're doing for their next project is a movie uh, uh, based on the Lovecraft comics. Um, and I, I still think that I still think they're fantastic writers. I don't care what anyone says. I'll get into it. I don't care. Um, anyone who said, here's the big thing when the Game of Thrones final season was going on. Okay, people had a lot. People had their problems with it. Understandably, by the way. But anyone who was saying, okay, that it's the writer's fault because they didn't have the book to adapt from anymore is a fucking moron. 
because the best season of Game of Thrones is season six. And that season was completely original from their fucking mind. These fucking guys, these writers with no book to adapt, season six was theirs, okay? They got, they took, they got a couple of little things, you know, from George R. R. Martin, but they wrote that season. They wrote season seven. They wrote season eight without the books. Okay, so eight wasn't great, but the best season of the series, season six, was all them. So to say that that season eight sucked because they didn't have the book to adapt from, you're a fucking idiot. Just putting it out there. <laughs> They're fantastic writers, okay? They gave us that. Sh they still. They're still the people who put that whole. It 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 takes a lot to adapt something. It's not as simple as just reading the book and like just going. Okay, here's this and here's this. And he you have to really kind of create your own vision for what the world is and for what the story is. It's not easy to say that they're terrible writers. Is just fucking moronic. Can't wait to see what they do next. Seriously. I was bummed when they left Star Wars. They were going to do they were going to do whatever the next string of movies were going to be for Star Wars. They were going to do it and then they they had to bow out cuz they signed a big deal with Netflix. Now we know what one of the projects that they're doing with Netflix is. I think this is Netflix. Yeah. Um look at Netflix. Man, they're getting all the Vertigo shit now. Sandman, Lovecraft, Yeah, can't wait for this. Yeah. We're still recording. We're still recording. Kevin Feige says Black Widow will reveal what Natasha did in between major MCU movies. Sounds... Understandable, considering that the movie itself takes place in between major MCU movies. Uh, I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot of news this week. That's why I wanted to talk about Sandman, Lovecraft. Uh, and I, uh, now there's a rumor that, and this is old news too, but there's a rumor that Scorsese's next film will also be Netflix again. So that he had a lot of they had a lot of success working together for The Irishman, and now his next film, called uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, which is based on a novel, which will be starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. So his two superstars who he's worked with on the most films with on the most films with but never together, are now going to be together for the first time with him in a movie. DiCaprio, De Niro, finally together with Scorsese. That's cool. Like, I love how each movie he's doing now is kind of like historical in that regard. He never worked with Pacino before. Irishman worked with Pacino. Never had a film where Pacino, Pesci, and De Niro were all together. I mean, like, things like that. Like, So this, Killers of the Flower Moon is his next one, and now apparently I guess the budget is fucking going up just like the Irishman did and, and he's approaching Netflix with it um, I love that I can just that movie's right there on Netflix I'll tell you the, the big downside with having things come out on Netflix um, is that I can't I like to collect movies so I, I buy movies on iTunes I have a, a catalog of fucking movies that are that I own um I can't do that with anything that comes out on Netflix. So, I like, Scorsese is my all-time favorite filmmaker, and I can't own The Irishman because their Netflix movies are not available to buy on iTunes. But it's, you know, whatever. It's still right there on my TV. I go, I go to Netflix, and The Irishman's right there to watch anytime I want. Um, same thing with Roma. I couldn't buy Roma because um, it was Netflix. It, it's whatever. It's just it would be cool if they worked out some kind of deal so that you can still put your shit out on, on iTunes. I don't know. It's it, it it's kind of it kind of defeats the purpose though. I guess you don't need two places to get Netflix is already the you just go. To, it does defeat the purpose. You don't need 
if you don't need it on iTunes to buy or rent. It's right on Netflix. And if you have a subscription, it's right there. Like to what? I guess so. It doesn't make sense to... Whatever. Um, and then there's this. So Warner Bros. is reportedly considering replacing Ezra Miller as The Flash. Uh, so as DC's fucking confusing continuity errors continue... You're gonna what recast him? I the 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 reason they're doing this is because there was a video leak that he of him like choking somebody like a woman or something, which is fucking ridiculous, and you should not do that. I mean, at the same time, who the fuck knows what that woman was saying to get him to fucking choke her? I mean, let's. <laughs> it's never okay to put your hands on a woman, but but women have a way of just fucking getting you. I don't know. I, He's a fucking celebrity, though. He should know better, too. I mean, someone was obviously going to be there recording. He gets replaced. It's his own, it's his own fucking fault for being a fucking piece of shit. No. But it would, my point of bringing this up was that it would add to the more of DC's continuity errors. Uh, you know, and now another Flash. <laughs> it's just a rumor right now. They're not necessarily replacing him yet, but... Uh, despite DC's flaws, I always thought he worked really good as The Flash. Funny. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's not as compelling of a universe. It doesn't, like, pull you in. It doesn't You don't get hyped the same way you do for, like, Marvel. Like, it's just not the same. Um... There's a new trailer out you should check out. It's called Extraction. Uh, the Russo brothers who did the Avengers movies are doing this movie with Chris Hemsworth, Thor. <laughs> uh, so, of course, they teamed up again. This one is about... He's like some kind of assassin or black ops something. I don't know. It, it's an action-packed... It looks cool. Um, I will say, if it's the Russo brothers, they're... Their films have the best fucking fight sequences. I mean, fuck me, man. The Winter Soldier, Captain America the Winter Soldier has some of the best fucking choreographed fight scenes in any movie. Not even just superhero movie. Those fucking... Captain America becomes so, so much more of a savage once the Russo brothers took took on his character. Like, in the... You'll notice. You can tell, too. Go back and watch the first Captain America... Directed by Joe Johnson, and uh, it you know took place in World War II era. The fight scenes in that don't even come close. It, it almost what they made Captain America more Captain America when they made him a badass martial artist expert in fucking Winter Soldier. And then every time he fights in any movie after that too, it's it's how you would it's how you would expect Captain America to actually fight like like a fucking savage, like a badass. Um, and this movie, so we'll get Chris Hemsworth kicking ass with some probably epic choreographed fight scenes. Um, go check that trailer out. It's called Extraction. Uh, that's it for news, and I want to move on because I don't, I'm running a little long because of the technical issues, and I just, oh, a quick note. So, Jerry Seinfeld fans, he announced his next special on Netflix. It'll be out on May 5th. Definitely watching that. This week is Crystalia on the 14th, Tuesday the 14th. Uh, no pain, Crystalia. Can't wait for that. Little, little comedy news. Okay, moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on. Let's do it. Don't stop. We're, we're doing good here. Don't stop recording on me, please. White Boy Rick. No, no, no. Stay with me. Just scrolling down a little bit. It's all I'm doing. Come on. Scroll. It literally can't even scroll. All right, so as usual, there's spoilers ahead for if you haven't seen White Boy Rick yet. Um, so the big thing right off the bat I'm going to talk about with this movie is that it was, it, it was flawed. Um, 
I'm, I will get into that now. I will talk about the things that didn't work. It's not going to just be me. I'm actually going to get into some bad things like that I didn't like or didn't things that I thought didn't work in a movie. Okay, this one was uh, was overall a structural mess. Okay, um, and I'll get into why um, in a, in a second. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about some of the things that did work or the things that I, I, I understood, like I understood what they were trying to do. Um, I, you know, like I see what, what they're, what the filmmakers are doing. So the overall themes of this story are family and desperation. It's clear Rick continuously goes out of his way to try and make a stake in the game the drug game, because he is surrounded by poverty and filth. If there is even the slightest chance he can get him and his family out of that filth, he's going to take it. Desperation. Uh, in terms of family, it's tough because Rick can't rely on his family that often. It's, it's tough. He has, a, he has a, a, a flawed family. They're not good at being a family. They don't know how to be a family. Um, so he can't really rely on them as, as much as he'd like to. But looking past all the dysfunctional elements, they are the only ones he can trust in the end. And that's what it becomes a big thing in this film is who he can trust. Um, they are his loved ones. Um, it's just unfortunate that they don't know how to be a proper family. Most unfortunate is Rick Sr., played by Matthew McConaughey, played... Matthew kind of is always good. Um, he really struggles with being a father. He doesn't know the best way to be a father to his children. So it's very unfortunate because he makes mistakes that then go on to affect and hurt his kids. So, uh, I mean, they caught his, his bad choices, they cost Rick Jr. most of all, too, as, as the movie goes on to, to point out. Um, his persona, I mean, he's, his, he's a father to his son, so his persona is supposed to be an inspiring or modeling figure to Rick, and therefore Rick also makes bad decisions just like his father, Rick Jr. Reflecting his father in that way, he also struggles with making the best decisions. He makes poor decisions as well. They both do. Um... But I think what it comes down to, too, is is that overall you can't give up on family. Rick tries his best to save his father and his sister, but the only way he sees he can do that is by embracing the very filth that destroys his father and sister, which is those, these criminal elements of their surroundings, of their environment. Um, I mean, in the end, it's only his family there for him. He can't even trust his friends, as he comes to learn. They're not really his friends. Um... And, mo and he can't even trust the cops. That's the big one. He couldn't even trust the fucking cops to, do, to help him out. Um, Rick Sr. even says in the falling actions of the film to, to Rick when he's behind bars and they're talking, um, he says, you're my best friend. You're my only friend. And it turns out his father and sister are his only true friends. I mean, his other friends fucking have him try to have him killed so I mean it's, they're not his real friends um, so it's not hard to see the direction they're going in this film they move forward and things progress naturally we're moving towards something so that works um, and it's a true story so it's important to know that Rick Wersh Jr. was fucked over by circumstances by people and by his own desperate decisions the story really becomes about how he's fucked over by the cops and the system. The film is meant to enlighten us on Rick's story and the fact that he is a regular person who is being unnecessarily punished for a nonviolent crime that he is still in prison for right now. He's still in prison and he didn't, it's not like he killed anyone or anything, and he's, it's fucking insane. He went in at, like, 18 years old, he's 50 years old. I mean, it's, it's insane. Um, he's more than paid for anything he did at this point, you know? 
the problem is the filmmakers don't make it clear uh, that this enlightening approach is the approach they're taking. So it's it's like this is what the movie's really about is to let us be aware of Rick Worsh Jr.'s situation. But the filmmakers struggle to take a direct approach in that regard. They 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 like they go back and forth between their their overall focus. Like like it, at times I was like, am I supposed to enjoy watching this or am I supposed to feel sad for him which is ultimately what I think it becomes about um is it glorifying the crime part is it shedding light on something you know like it's just kind of all over the place with the approach to the film um it has a hard time narrowing in on one approach to the story and what tone it should be taking on uh, Rick and his father finally decide to start selling drugs at a, at a moment in the film in a desperate move to escape as escape is subtly, subtly, subtly implied as what they really want to be doing multiple times in this film. They want to get away from all this shit. They want to escape. Uh, so they they finally make this big decision at 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 what I guess you could call the reversal of the film, is when they both agree to start heavily selling. I suppose that's the reversal. Like I said, it's a structural mess, so I had a hard time narrowing it on, like, the plot, big, you know, the plot points, because there's a, there's kind of a lot of big, big moments that are crammed together, where it should have been more built to this big moment, build, 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 build to this big moment, build, build, build to this big moment. That's how you're really supposed to do it, and each big moment is, like, a main plot point. But this one had, like, things just kind of crammed together. So that moment when they make that big decision to start selling uh, is is either the reversal or reaffirmation. I don't really know. Um, but like I said, there's a, I, you know, it's a structural mess. So The line he says to his dad is, we got to do this before it's too late. And I took that as, yeah, we got to do this before we find ourselves sh- sh- fucking dead. Uh, before this environment kills us got to get out of here they want to get out of this shit so they make a desperate decision to start selling rick uh so rick jr having a daughter of his own is an is important for the story but like i said before there's just there's too much going on Uh, i couldn't narrow in on what the the main plot points were because the filmmakers pack in too much information there are too many years shoved into not enough story time and it doesn't give us enough enough depth into what builds to all these big moments. So, I mean, taking this autobiographical approach means being careful and precise in how you lay out the events. Instead, we are just given a lot of info on this true story. Like, just one thing after the... Like, the, the him having a daughter is thrown at us. It's thrown in. Um, him getting shot is kind of thrown in. Like, it's, it's just not... It doesn't flow the way it sh- I would have liked it to. Uh, and and um, I did like how uh, how Detroit in the eighties, this environment, clearly shapes the people. So you could say you could easily say that Rick was a product of his environment, and it's not entirely his fault. And I'd probably agree with that. Um, it's sad Rick gets that black time, as um, Johnny says to him, uh, because it's it's as if the the cops, it's it's as if to the cops these people are all just scum to be taken advantage of. They take advantage of him and use him, um, and then they fuck him over. Uh, Bruce Dern, his his little fun role in this movie he's like a tiny role in this movie but it's like it's kind of standout moment uh, to have him but he says it best in the courtroom at the end he says you just took a life and they and the, and the system did they took a life making him stay in prison all this time um so you know the movie was it was 
pretty flawed. So with that being said, there's nothing exceptionally resonant in terms of direction or visuals. It wasn't like a... It was just messy. But it was still enjoyable. Okay? At least it was still enjoyable. Um, the story is supposed to focus on the dy dynamic between father and son, right? Although not always effectively. Fatherhood is a recurring theme. Rick becoming a father himself is a key plot moment for establishing the steps that will be taken, the choices that will be made by both Rick Jr. and Rick Sr. So him having a daughter was like the tipping point. Like, I have a daughter now too, Dad. Uh, we got to do this before it's too late. Um, but overall, I had a hard time dealing with Rick Sr.'s inability to act. Uh, he's, he just doesn't know how to fucking father his kids. Like, is it strength or cowardice? Because he's scared, but for a good reason. He warns his kids. Like, he's scared of happening what ends up happening. Many times in the film, he, he tries to warn his kids, don't do this, don't do that, but he doesn't take the right act, actions to actually get them to not do it. He doesn't know how to get them to not do what they end up doing. Like, don't do drugs, don't sell drugs. He can't get the, that point across. And and it, it ends up being because, like, why would he? When their situation is so shitty, it ends up, you have to, he, he has to, they have to start selling drugs if they want any chance of getting out of this crappy environment that they're in. Um, I don't know. I guess he was doing... I guess he does the best he can, Rick Sr. I don't know. And he, he knew the cops couldn't be trusted, too, from the start. He warns Rick of this. He tries to protect him. He just doesn't know how. Uh, I like how for Rick... For Rick Jr., our main character, it's a battle between desperation and morality... So, like, these are kind of what clash for his character. He still chooses to work with the cops because despite Rick's, Rick Sr.'s um, flaws in raising his kids, he still impresses right and wrong upon his kids and upon Rick the best that he can. And so Rick does want to do what's right at the same time, that he's trying to decide what actions he should take out of desperation to help his family. Um, it's important we know their differences. So Rick doesn't think it's stronger or braver to do nothing. Rick Jr. wants to take action. Rick Sr. doesn't do anything to, to actually get them out of, of their situation. Rick Sr. is like scared, really. But for good reason, um, as, we, as we come to find out. Um, and so in terms of performances, like McConaughey worked for me, it was good. But honestly, I struggled with Richie Merritt. Richie Merritt plays Rick Jr. Performance was it was okay. Um, I, I I had a hard time pulling. He, he his performance had a hard time pulling me in um, to care enough about the character. But then I that that might not be his fault. It might just be the sloppy writing. It might not be his performance. I, honestly, so there was a, the breakout performance of the film for me is actually those few moments where the little kid. That little, the brother of Brenda comes, knocks on the door. It was, that was a great little performance, that kid. Um, it was, it was effective. It was, it came out of nowhere and it was funny. Uh, the young actor who played that kid did a great job, whoever he was. Um, and also Bruce Stern was, had a small role, but like I said, it was, he manages to be every bit the Bruce Stern gloriousness that we love for Bruce Stern. Um, one thing I will say, it would have been nice to know if Rick Sr. Uh, stuck by his son through all the following years after this. There's no mention of that. Um, one of the more impactful moments of the film is when Rick Sr. Uh, realizes his failures. This is when McConaughey's performance really shined for me. Uh, he... He realizes the ways he really hurt his son, the ways he failed his son, when he apologizes to Rick at the end. He truly understood his role in causing things, too. 
uh, he decided to trust those cops, and it cost his son. He he it didn't he didn't exactly say no, don't trust them. He said, okay, I think we should do it. So his son puts puts his faith in his dad there, and it it costs him. So I think I, overall he knew he failed Rick. It, it, was, it, was, it was a sad moment. I just, I, I wish they would have let us know if Rick Sr. remained a presence in Rick's life behind bars. Because if he didn't, then he truly couldn't change. He was a failure. He was, he, he didn't know how to be a father. He was, you know. Or, or did he redeem himself and, and remain by his son's side all that time? They just don't mention it. Um, because if he would have been there f fighting to get Rick out all these years, it would have been more effective. The only mention of him is that he died in 2014. So Rick Sr., the real Rick Sr., died in 2014. But they don't mention if he was like, like a pres an impactful presence in Rick's life all these other years that he was in prison. I think we kind of might have needed to know that because the story is about the father and son relationship. Um, so my overall take on this film is, is, is the flaws. I have to talk about the flaws. It's just, I'm big on story and without it, nothing else works uh, the way it's supposed to. Structurally, I mentioned how it's convoluted, the ordering of big events. Um, it was actually harmful that this was a true story. It harmed the structure because they just packed all these true moments in just to make sure we made knew all these things happened and didn't order it the right thing and build the things the right way. Um, the characters, they lack depth sometimes didn't feel invested enough in Rick's character or any characters because we either didn't spend enough time with them or we spent the wrong time with them. Um, didn't make me care enough until the end so I could see how the first hour of this film could maybe lose audiences or the first hour pulled you in and the back half lost you. I could see that too. I, I wonder if the focus should have been more on Rick's time as an actual drug dealer. So again, approach to this film. The trailer marketed this film as like, as being about a young, about the youngest kingpin in crime history kind of thing. But we don't feel that really. That's, that's not what this story is about. Um, yeah, so like the trailer marketed that way, but I didn't really feel that at all. Uh, I would have had the choice to turn fully into a criminal happen earlier in the film. Maybe happen, ha have, that, have that happen earlier and then spend more time with him as an actual drug dealer. Perhaps, but I guess they did the best they could with the information they had. Um, a film like this honestly should have been structured different. And by that, it means it should have been a longer movie. It should have been longer. It's like an hour and 40 minutes, but it sh they needed like two hours and 15. They needed more time. It needed more time, and it needed to be planned out differently. The approach to it should have, should have been different and it should have been longer. The pacing too. The pacing is all off because of this uh, and that hurts the characters arcs. Uh, the change we see the characters go through is conveyed ineffectively. We do get some change after Rick learns he's a father and change for every character. There's the moment where everyone's kind of doing good um, but it's not built too properly and it unravels ineffectively. I would say overall much of the plot is building the moments ineffectively. With no hook the climax suffers. Or I guess in the words of Aristotle 
this film ties the knot well, but you have a, you uh, unravels it ill, <laughs> or some variation of that. If I tried to even guess what the structure of this film is, it would maybe be something like this. The reversal is when he gets gunned down by his one of, by one of his friends in his own home. Clearly, a big turning point. Um, maybe there's a, an act two climax, a down and out moment, and that's when they are caught by the cops and arrested right in their home. And that's a sad moment too because it started off as a happy moment between Rick and Dawn, the sister, and then it just turns to shit. They, they get caught. And Rick Sr. knew they were risking everything. He said that the state of things is fragile and he doesn't want it to break, and inevitably it breaks. Uh, this film is a tragedy at its heart, so that's why the climax is a negative outcome. So if you're hoping for a happy ending, no, it's, it's a tragedy, and, and it's a true story. So what happened, happened, and it's a sad ending. But it's a poor attempt. Um, it, it's a tragedy, but it's a poor attempt at a tragedy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. White Boy Rick. Uh, still enjoyable enough. Clearly, I had my uh, quarrels with the movie. All in all, you have to make it believable that a 15-year-old kid is running the show with a father incapable of being the adult between the two. And that's tough. That's a tough approach to a story, to a characters, and uh, I had a hard time getting hooked by that concept. Um, it's a challenge to mix crime with kids. So be careful if you're writing anything like this. Like I said, I am writing something kind of similar in that the main character is a teenager. Uh, at the start, it's a TV show. So he becomes a man as the series goes on. My idea, but, um, but this, this is the kind of concept that maybe could have worked as a TV show. If you expanded this and to like a five season series. Maybe it's a fantastic series about Rick Worst Jr. Jr.'s story. Uh, you could spend a whole season or two with him just really in the crime game. I don't know though. Maybe it didn't last as long. Maybe it lasted, maybe it lasted just as long as the movie showed us. Um, maybe he wasn't a drug dealer that long. But that's the thing too. <laughs> don't market it that way. No, but overall, it's it's not that the film is not enjoyable, because at times it is. Here's what it isn't. It's not resonant. It won't age well. You know? Um, at least the themes are compelling, and the performances are good enough to make it interesting. So for these reasons, I gave it a 7.3. It was okay. It was just okay. All right, we actually made it through, so that's good. I have one cut to edit. Soon my phone didn't stop recording right now. By the way, you'll notice that the video is different than the audio, it's because it did stop recording. <laughs> I have two cuts to edit now. Uh, so I'm changing the, uh, the quote of the week segment. Uh, I'm not doing just sci-fi, because it's been tough for people. Some people just don't watch sci-fi. Uh, what I'm going to do now is the quote is going to be from a movie that is in the same genre as the movie that I'm talking about in the current week. So this week's a crime movie, so I'm going to talk about a crime movie. And and so I picked a sci-fi before this, and luckily the sci-fi movie I picked is also a crime movie, so here it is. I don't want to talk about time travel because if we start talking about it, then we're going to be all here all day talking about it, making diagrams with straws. Name that movie. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Ben Morganti. I hope that things work out te technologically for me because I want to keep doing this every week. If I have to stop for a little bit, it's just because I can't. I can't deal with this fucking computer anymore. 
or the computer literally will not let me do. Like if I start trying to do this next week and this was tough, this week almost didn't hold out. If there's a week where it just will not let me work, um, I'm gonna have to take a break and, until I can figure things out. Until all this stuff maybe settles down to start working again, start making money, and then maybe buy a new computer. Uh, but as always, follow the show on Instagram at Screen Preach. Follow me on Instagram at the Ben Morganti, and also on Twitter at the same, the Ben Morganti. Um, you can find this wherever you listen to pod podcasts, which is Apple Podcasts or YouTube. My channel is Morganti Studios. If you really want to support the show, become a patron at Patreon. Look for me, Ben Morganti, and become a patron. Other than that, we're all done. And uh, have a cinematic week.